Folks, brace yourselves because the unthinkable is officially happening. You won't believe it. U.S. Navy and aerial deployments are, as we speak, seemingly setting up for a massive escalation, and we need to discuss what's going on and how to prepare. At the same time, the big money is sounding the alarms behind the scenes and amongst themselves. We're going to talk about what they're saying, how they're positioning, and their thought process. We're going to show some key details as to how you can both Again, protect yourself as well as hopefully make some money. Remember, there are but two types of people in the market. The people that ignore what's going on and lose their butts and the people that learn and listen to what's going on and win somebody else's butts. Let's get to work. And if you find value in all the work that goes into videos like this, all I ask in return is that you hit that subscribe button and perhaps share this video with a friend. Okay, so a couple days ago, the USS Dwight Eisenhower arrived in the Middle East amid the attacks on US forces in Iraq and Syria that Pentagon officials say are being done by Iran proxies. And right now, if you look at our carrier strike groups around the world, we have 11 total and five of them are underway right now. The USS Dwight Eisenhower right now is underway in the Red Sea, which is that area between Saudi Arabia and Africa. The USS Gerald Ford is underway south of Cyprus. Now, folks, these carrier strike groups are no joke. They project a ton of power and serve as a deterrent in a region where they are deployed, any region. These carrier strike groups are a way for America to say, hey, fellas, think twice before you pull a fast one, because it'll be your last move. You look at the U.S. Naval Institute news data, you can see we also have the USS Mesa Verde and the USS Mount Whitney, as well as the Baton ARG in the general vicinity as well. The USS Mount Whitney is a powerful amphibious command ship. The USS Mesa Verde is an amphibious transport dock. The Bataan is a freaky, freaky ship. This is the type of ship you see right before you die. This is a ship of just total destruction and death. The Bataan is a WASP-class amphibious assault ship, and boy, does this pack a fatal, fatal sting for anything that crosses it. It carries some serious artillery and assault-ready aircrafts of different shapes and sizes, ones that you may have never even seen before. And the U.S. also has some Pat Forsa FRCs, which are U.S. U.S. Coast Guard boats tasked with being responsible for oil platform security in the Persian Gulf, mostly patrolling off the coast of Oman, Iran, and Pakistan. These are there pretty much all the time, but don't be surprised if you start seeing some movements in them as well as the Iran-U.S. proxy war conflict starts broadening. Now, with all of this being said, the real deployment and change of deployment, rather, that should send chills down your spine is the fact that the U.S. just sent an Ohio-class submarine to the region. Now, Ohio might not sound very scary to you. Cleveland might not sound very scary to you, but this is no Cleveland, folks. Remember, folks, America has what's called a nuclear triad, land, air, and sea. These Ohio ships are the sea part of the triad. From the Times of Israel, quote, Ohio-class subs are both nuclear-powered and capable of carrying nuclear warheads. The arrival of the submarine in the region was apparently part of the same strategy that has seen the Pentagon dispatch two carrier strike groups in order to deter Iran and its proxies, not least the Lebanon-based Hezbollah terror group, from attacking Israel amid its war against Hamas. Now, here's the thing. As you might expect, the U.S. doesn't really like to publicize where its nuclear-capable and ready submarines are. I go in public with where this Ohio submarine is, the U.S. is sending a very, very loud signal saying Iran and anyone else that wants to take advantage of the situation, you better watch your back. And folks, in addition to releasing the photo of the submarine on Sunday, the Central Command separately posted an image of a nuclear-capable B-1 bomber also operating in the Middle East. I don't know about you folks, but things seem to be getting real messy real fast, especially for those of us that don't like to see a lot of American intervention in other parts of the world. <coughs> so we need to discuss how people in the big money world are reacting to all of this. If you think they aren't paying attention to this, you've got another thing coming. They want to protect themselves and they want to make money. So Ken Griffin of the infamous Citadel is making headlines this morning saying the peace dividend is over and high inflation is likely to last decades. If you forgot, this is of course the fella who got a lot of hate for the AMC short situation because his company is a major market maker providing liquidity and trade execution to retail and most of the major brokers that you use and love or hate. And to be quite frank with you, I mean, he does have a bit of an evil supervillain look to him. And folks, quite frankly, it's almost unbelievable how much dough he rakes in, so much that he's been acquiring Palm Beach property after Palm Beach property for the last 10 plus years, and is now putting together a $1 billion mega estate, which will be the most expensive home on earth. He also just bought this $107 million mansion over in Miami, right on the water, really, really beautiful spot, which kind of seems like he bought it just for shits and giggles, since he's building that $1 billion house. He's like, oh, I just want to buy this $100 million house, live in it 
for a few years until my billion dollar house is built. And then I guess I'll just donate that old house to the poor. But anyways, this is what he said from Bloomberg, quote, the peace dividend is clearly at the end of the road, Griffin said at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum on Thursday in Singapore, referencing the Russia, Ukraine and Israel Hamas wars. We are likely to see higher real rates and we're likely to see higher nominal rates. The billionaire said that will have implications on the cost of funding the U.S. deficit, saying the government hadn't counted on higher rates when we went on the spending spree that created a $33 trillion deficit. Okay, folks, so if you go over to the U.S. debt clock, you can see the average debt per citizen is $100,355. Do you pay taxes? Are you a taxpayer? Well, you're $259,103 in debt. Uncle Sam basically bought a brand new Lamborghini or Turbo Porsche in your name with a 100% loan, then crashed it and laughed as it burnt. And now you're on the hook to pay back that loan. Lucky you. You'll be paying it back for the rest of your life with a destroyed currency, institutional collapses, less and less economic opportunity, higher and higher taxes, and maybe even foreign wars. Now, the cost of paying interest on the U.S. debt pile, as you might imagine, has skyrocketed as a result of the high interest rate environment we have entered into. It's easy for government to borrow trillions when interest is low. It's a different story when those rates skyrocket. We just surged past a trillion dollars in yearly interest just to pay the interest on the loans. This is the first time in history, folks, in history. Net interest is setting up to be the biggest line item on the U.S. budget ahead of Social Security, Medicare, and defense. A lot of people say we spend too much on defense. Truth is, we're setting up to spend a lot more. Actually, we already spend a lot more on interest alone. So back to Griffin. Griffin is saying here that he thinks the Federal Reserve, Papa Powell, can indeed keep printing and probably will to avoid a default of all of this. Basically, eventually saying, okay, well, government can't afford, can't afford to pay the interest anymore. Let's go ahead and cut the rates down to nothing. But Griffin is saying the economic consequences of that would be devastating. The minute we start to print dollars just to deal with the possibility of a default, well, our economy is going to go into a deep, deep tailspin. And you can already see the real world impacts of economic policies that have led us to this situation. Economic policies that, by the way, were the results of both Republicans and Democrats. The fact of the matter is right now, folks, that polls show that the vast majority of Americans are unhappy with the economy. Just 2%. Just 2% of voters say the economy is excellent. And most of those are probably in Congress or people that are working for the government, which seems to be an ever-growing industry. Another poll from the Wall Street Journal just found that more than 8 in 10 Americans say the economy is poor or not so good under Biden. And in fact, one out of one Charlie's in an in-house poll that we did here at Zip Trader also thought that the economy stinks under Biden. And that was a completely unbiased poll of one. But then you'll see a lot of articles out there that are trying to explain this away as saying, well, Americans might say the economy stinks, but they are still spending like it's great. So they must not know what they are talking about. Or you'll see articles arguing that Biden should get more credit, why Americans aren't giving Biden credit on the improving economy, according to experts. And you'll even see Biden himself trying to make the case that his Bidenomics are one of his main strengths. I mean, to be fair, he's certainly stronger on the economy than he is on his foreign policy. Just ask the Taliban. But what is the situation here and what's the truth? Well, from CNN, despite all kinds of positive news on inflation, it's slowing. The job market, best in a generation, and consumer spending still robust. Americans can't seem to shake their despair. So the question here is, how can people be in despair if inflation is slow and the job market is so great and consumer spending is up? Well, the problem really comes down to one thing, the cost of living. Inflation is indeed slowing. The worsening of inflation is slowing, but prices are still up nearly 20% since 2019. Prices are still up. They're not coming down. So it's not like people are in a better situation because because things are slow and just the pace at which their financial situation is deteriorating is slowing. Even if you use the government's own fancy CPI curving data set, well, $1 in 2023 is only worth 83 cents in 2019 dollars. At the same time, it's now more expensive than it has been in decades to get a loan on a house, loan for a car, and rent has skyrocketed across the country. In some areas, it is coming down. But overall, I mean, things are a lot more expensive than they were in 2019. So you now have Americans spending more than ever because things are more expensive than ever and they have virtually no no choice but to spend that if they want to live. A lot of people say, well, just don't buy food. That's how you save. Well, you got to have food in order to eat, but they are right. If people don't buy food, they're going to save a lot of money. And if you die, well, you don't have to pay rent anymore. You certainly don't have to pay taxes anymore. Dying in 2023 seems to be a pretty decent financial move. And I guess it's good for the environment too. Just wait until they start talking about this. This is going to be the next step. But anyways, the only thing that you can really say is uniquely strong about this economy is that there are a lot of jobs, but the job data sets don't really do a good job at distinguishing a really, really good paying job from a really, really low paying job. They just say, oh, every job is equal. But of course, that's not the case. Some jobs pay a lot more and are a lot more stable and a lot more healthy for the economy as compared to other ones where there's not a 
good amount of hours, you don't get full-time work, so on and so forth. And you've had some states like my soon-to-be former home state of California mandating that workers at fast food restaurants get paid higher hourly rates, and they just increased the minimum wage to $20 for those fast food companies, which goes into effect in 2024. And then right after that, you had restaurant chains saying they will pass on 100% of the cost to consumers. So what ends up happening is that you end up pricing out a lot of lower income to middle income consumers, and they end up not even being able to go anymore because they simply can't afford it. Because you've just continuously forced restaurants to raise prices higher and higher and higher. And then when nobody can afford the new cost of living, they go back and they say, we have to raise the minimum wage to $500 in those fast food restaurants. Now, don't get me wrong. People need to be paid a fair wage for their work. And people should bargain as hard as possible for as much money as possible. I'm a big believer in that. However, when you get into the situation where government is blanketly mandating record high minimum wages for industries that have very, very low margins, well, you got to understand while that might be popular in the public, it's that same public that is going to have to pay for that. And a lot of those people simply aren't going to be able to pay for that. And it's going to be a disaster. And then you have a cost of living crisis that just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Why do you think a growing number of Americans are pulling money from their 401k plans early and taking on penalties just to live? Why do you think we keep getting record high after record high in credit card? Card debt. Well, because people can't afford to live. And a lot of that has to do with overborrowing, overprinting, overspending. A lot of that has to do with state and local regulations that force businesses to raise prices. And some of that has to do with some foreign policy decisions that have also really restricted trade or created some tension where there didn't need to be tension. And every time one of these policies is enacted, of course, you and I have to pay for it. So I think that it's really, really important that we're informed on this issue. Quite frankly, folks, I don't really see that many people on either side of the aisle making much of an effort to substantially cut spending, to de-escalate the world or even to fix things on a state and local level. Anyways, folks, let us know what you think about all of this down in the comment section down below. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and share this with a friend if you found value in this video. We appreciate each and every single one of you. Have a good one. We'll see you in the next video.